Number 28. In some countries, liquid nitrogen is used on dairy trucks instead of mechanical refrigerators. A three-hour delivery trip requires 200 liters of liquid nitrogen, which has a density of 808 kilogram per cubic meter. Letter A. Calculate the heat transfer necessary to evaporate this amount of liquid nitrogen and raise its temperature th to 3 degrees Celsius. Use the CP value, blah, 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 blah. Okay. So um, basically what we need here is a uh, volume of liquid nitrogen, 200 liters. They told us the density. So first thing is, if we're going to try to find heat transfer, you know all of the, well, not all of them, but the, the ones involving um, uh, thermal heat transfer here, right, have mass in them. Okay, so I know I'm going to need mass, so why don't we just get that out of the way? So density is equal to then the mass divided by the volume. They told, you know, if we're solving for mass, it's just simply the density multiplied by the volume. We're talking about the liquid nitrogen, so the density of that liquid nitrogen was 808 kilogram per cubic meter. And the volume they gave it to us in liters, but we have to convert that into uh, cubic meters, so we have consistent units between the density and the volume. So you know to convert this, just divide that by 1,000. And that would be 0 uh, 0.200. All right, that's then in cubic meters. So all we now need to do is just multiply these two together. So 808 times 0 0.2. So it's 161.6, right? And that is kilograms. All right, so that's the mass. Now, we have to make an assumption here. They don't tell us at what temperature the liquid nitrogen is starting at. So... Uh, since they don't tell us, uh, we're free to choose whatever we want. I'm going to make it easy, and I'm just going to choose that it is beginning basically at the boiling point. So the liquid nitrogen is like just at this particular temperature, just getting ready to boil. All right, and convert into gas. So that's my assumption. If you guys have a different assumption, your calculation, you know, your answer will be different than mine, which is totally acceptable. There is no right or wrong here. It just depends on your, you can be right or wrong based off of your assumptions. But in terms of, I don't know, a book having a certain value, they're just assuming something that they're not stating. So, you know, just keep that in mind. All right. Uh, so now I want to figure out then the amount of heat uh, transfer necessary to evaporate all right, this particular mass of liquid nitrogen. So I'm talking about the uh, phase change formula up there. So Q will equal the mass multiplied by the latent heat of vaporization here. So the energy necessary to vaporize the liquid nitrogen is the mass of that liquid nitrogen, 161.6, multiplied by the uh, latent heat of vaporization. And that is right here. It's gotten from your tables, 201. Okay, that's in kilojoules. Just be careful. You know what? Let me keep everything consistent. Let me put that in joules. So just multiply that by 1,000. All right, simple enough. Let's multiply it on out. All right, and what do we get? So 3.3.425, I guess. 3.25 times 10 raised to the, what is that, 6, 7? Yeah, it looks like a 7 to me. Raised to the 7th, and that's in joules. Okay, that's great. And now what we need to do is now we need to... Um, do the, so now we know that the, this is the amount of energy that's necessary to just phase change the liquid nitrogen into gaseous nitrogen, and the temperature hasn't changed. But now we need to go from this temperature, as they told us, then to 3 degrees Celsius. So now that's part C, basically, right? And we're going to use this formula now, since we're not dealing with a phase change. It's MC delta T. This is all for the liquid nitrogen. So the heat necessary uh, to be uh, basically absorbed right, by that uh, steam, uh, by that gaseous nitrogen is going to be equal to the mass, which is 161.6, multiplied by the specific heat. So that's about, that's 1040. They said assume constant pressure. There's two values in the table. This is the constant pressure value, right, for that liquid nitrogen. And then the temperature change. So the final was 3 degrees Celsius, and the initial, minus than the initial, which was negative 195.8. Okay, calculate it. Let's throw it on in. So we got 161.6 times 1040 multiplied then by 3 plus 195.8. And here we go, another large value. This is going to be 3.34 times 10 raised to the, let's see, 3, 6, 7 again. Okay. And that's in joules. So the total now amount of heat would be then the amount of heat energy gained just in the phase change. And then the amount of heat energy gained by going from negative 195 degrees Celsius to 3 degrees Celsius. So then the last piece of this puzzle is just adding them together to find the total, right? So you're just going to add the two boxed 
blue and red values. And when we do that, I'm going to use exact values here. So we get about 6.59 or so, 6.59 times 10 raised to the, yeah, that should be again, 7. Yep, times 10 to the 7th, and that is in terms of joules. And I put an equal sign, D doesn't equal that, but the total Q does. And there we go, voila. Okay, so let's get rid of some of this work so we have a little more space. All right, hopefully you guys are having a great day today. Right. It's always, as I say, a great day when you're doing physics. Who's with me? No one? Okay. All right. Letter B. All right. So what is the heat transfer rate in kilowatt hours? All right. Uh, so basically, first thing is, what's a kilowatt or what is a watt? Right. That's a unit for power. Oh, power. What's the formula for power? Power is equal to energy over time. All right. So forget about the hour part, who cares? Let's just find kilowatts first, okay? So we have this amount of energy being supplied over this amount of time, right? There's about uh, 66 million joules being supplied over three hours. So we, we know the energy, and we know the time over which that energy is being uh, absorbed, and therefore we can calculate the power. Right, so it's simply going to be 6.59 times 10 to the seventh joules, that is, divided by then uh, three hours, but we got to convert that into seconds, right? So you can take your three hours and then hours on the bottom, seconds on the top. There are 3,600 seconds. Oops, let me give myself a little more space. 3,600 seconds in one hour. And we can just, lo and behold, throw that on into the calculator. So that original answer divided by three times 3,600. And here we have a value now of six, oh, just uh, 6,101 or so. And that is now in joules per second, okay? Or AKA, right? AKA watts. Okay. But they don't want watts, right? They want kilowatts. So what do I have to do next? Well, I got to take this particular value and then convert that into kilowatts. How do I do that? That's simple now. Watts on the bottom, kilowatt on the top. There's 1,000 watts for every 1 kilowatt divided by 1,000, and here you're going to work out to be 6.101 now, right? Kilowatts. Okay, great. So we got this part of the unit. Now we got to think about, well, what the heck do they mean by hours? Anytime you see this, anytime you see kilowatt hour, and not even kilowatt hour, anytime you see like A dash B, it just means that there's two values basically being multiplied together. You know, we're used to hearing something like, you know, kilowatt per hour or something like that, right? To say kilowatt hour, what does that mean? Well, you know that when you're dealing with, let's say, kilowatt per hour, kW per hour, you're doing a division. When you hear something then like a kilowatt, as I was mentioning, kilowatt hour, you're really doing a multiplication here, okay? So essentially, we have this particular uh, piece of the puzzle, okay? Now we just have to figure out, well, over how many hours was this was this power supplied? That's all it is. It's basically the rate okay, of energy consumption in seconds multiplied then by the total amount of time in hours that this energy was consumed. And that's it. So if you think about what I just mentioned now, right, the last piece here is now going to be the 6.101 kilowatts times then the time over which that power was uh, uh, was absorbed, basically, right? And that was three hours. So you just multiply. So this works out to be about 16, right? So let's see. Oop. Good, 18.3. So here, when we multiply this together now, it's 18.3 kilowatts, kilowatt hours. And that's it. Lo and behold... Question is over. Okay, now let us see. Let's erase some of this work. So how are you guys doing now? Any different from two minutes ago? No? A little better maybe about physics? Hopefully. All right, let us see. Compare the amount of cooling obtained from melting an identical mass of zero degree ice. And Okay, so basically we're saying... If this energy was applied to ice in order to phase change it, um, how much... Oh, no, no, excuse me. It said identical mass. My apologies. So what was the mass before? Oh, boy, I got to remember. It was 161. 
or so. Uh, let me look back at the calculator. Uh, uh, where are you? There it is, 161.6. Okay, so this was the amount of kilograms of liquid nitrogen. So now what we're going to do is we're going to assume that we have this amount of water, and we're going to then ask ourselves how much energy, all right, would be uh, basically absorbed by this mass of water. Again, we're talking about a simple phase change, so that's the formula at the top. So it's going to be Q is equal to ML. The heat now is going to be 161.6 multiplied by the latent heat of vapor, excuse me, of fusion. I wrote it right, said it wrong. Um, and that for water is about 300, 334 kilojoules, right? So that's going to be add the three zeros. And now we're going to have our value in joules. So just multiply that out, 161.6 times 334, 000. zero. Hold on, now i got to scroll all the way down on my calculator. Okay, 161.6 times then 334, 000. And here we have a value of about 5. Point, uh, yeah, 5.40 times 10 raised to the 3. That looks like uh, 7, right? Times 10 to the 7. And that is going to be now in terms of joules. All right, so compare the amount of cooling obtained from melting an identical mass of ice. Right, okay, so here, now we have uh, that particular value. Now we've got to compare the cooling, okay? So the liquid nitrogen's energy absorption is greater. Therefore, it has more cooling uh, properties to it. So we can do a simple division. You can do a ratio. Take this value, divide it by that value, and you can find out what fraction, um, you know, uh, water is here at zero degrees Celsius compared to the liquid nitrogen. Uh, so let's do that. And here we get about 82% or so, right? So about 82%. So basically just in terms of, I just wrote the number down, but in terms of the uh, comparison, if you have to, in terms of the liquid nitrogen, you have to convert that liquid nitrogen into gaseous nitrogen and then raise its temperature from negative 185, excuse me, 195, all the way to about 3 degrees Celsius. That'll get you this value. Or you just simply phase change the same mass of water. You don't even have to fluctuate its temperature. And that is that comprises 82% of the overall amount of energy dissipated by the liquid nitrogen. And the temperature, remember, of the water didn't change. So water is uh, pretty efficient um, in terms of uh, cooling. All right, guys, that's due to its high specific heat uh, capacities and so on and so forth. Anyway, guys, thanks for tuning in. Appreciate it very much. Hopefully this video helps. Please remember to help us out and subscribe, and we'll see you next time. Take care.